Thank you. The art of scripture. What scripture is an art form. And, there, and when you approach an art, a particular art, you, or, uh, you have to approach it in the right way. When people, for example, read Pride and Prejudice, they're not devastated to hear that Mr. Darcy or Mr. Bingley never existed. But because we know that is the genre. And uh, so, uh, but we are still getting, whether this is literally true or not, uh, important insights and truths about the human condition. Um, and uh, before the uh, modern period, it was impossible to write history as we do it today, finding out what actually happened. Uh, it's not until the 18th century when the British Museum was created, for example, uh, where, where we had the uh, knowledge of ancient languages and the science of archaeology to uncover uh, the truths about the past. In most of you, uh, uh, many, many people uh, today now are reading scripture in this very literal way and think if something uh, didn't happen, if they say something happened when it didn't, it isn't true. But what scripture does, it teaches us what to remember. And um, those of you who are, like myself, inching towards the old age, uh, will find that uh, it's more natural for human beings to forget. And history, is it, the historical teachings that we have in, in, in scripture are designed specifically to help to show what, what, what was important about this particular incident, not what actually happened which has got lost in the midst, midst of time. Furthermore, scripture was a performative art. Until about the 18th century, uh, most people couldn't read. Um, and until the invention of printing, it was impossible for people to get a copy of, say, the Bible, which was all kept in different, different manuscripts. People listened to scripture. The Quran is called uh, the word Quran means recitation. And Muslims listen to their text. People often tell me in a rather aggressive way, well, I've read the Quran. I, I said, you probably haven't, because uh, Muslims don't read it on a page like that. They listen. And when they're learning the Quran by scripture by heart, as they do, uh, they don't read it, learn it from a page. It's recited to them. And the recitation is itself an art form. People will go for miles to hear uh, a, 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 a well-known Quran reciter, um, just as they come to hear a, an important so soprano today. So really, reading scripture in the way we do today is not unlike um, reading the libretto of an opera. Half the effect of it has, is, is missing. Now, you can see, those of you who've got a copy, is that this is a thick book. So I've got three points here that I, that I want to develop uh, to, that gets us to the, I hope, to the heart of the matter. Looking at some of the, the ways that people think scripture should be read and then showing how it's been read over the ages. Because uh, in the West, when we started to create our scientific culture, uh, we started thinking much more factually and looking out for sort of historical accuracy and, and the literal truth of scripture. Uh, but that, it was a new development and it has been rather disastrous for, for our view of religion. Um, so the first, uh, my first point is that scripture does not impart facts or certainties which we are obliged to believe. Um, scripture is not telling us what we should believe. Um, in fact, it's telling us we, when we read scripture, we should realize the limits of what we know. The Tao that can be named is not the eternal Tao. That's, that's how the uh, Tao Te Ching, the most important Taoist scripture, begins. If you can say what the Tao is, that's not the Tao. 
And the same applies to God, a word we cr crash around with very easily. Um, and uh, we have certain ideas about him these days. You know, there he is in heaven, um, looking down on us. He looks, he uh, is, is, is watching us all and is judging us all. And uh, we will join him and Jesus it, late uh, at the end of our lives, if we're lucky. Um, this is what uh, I learned at eight years old in the Catholic Catechism. The question was, what is God? And quick as a flash, I chanted, God is the supreme spirit who alone exists of himself and is infinite in all perfections. Now, I have to say that at the age of eight, that left me rather cold. But I now think it's incorrect because it takes it for granted that you can simply draw a breath and define a word whose literal meaning is to set limits upon a reality that is illimitable, that is in, that it, it, it cannot, you cannot say what God is. And that is what scripture is telling us, um, except that we, now we look for, for facts. Um, so, the Mahabharata, for example, uh, at the end of that uh, extraordinarily popular uh, scripture in India, you haven't a clue what the gods are really up to. The heroes are going to heaven, and by the time that the scripture has played around with you and uh, you don't know whether heaven exists or not, whether it's just a chimera. And you don't know what on earth was the point of the absolutely devastating, appalling war uh, that ushered in our present age uh, was, uh, was worth saving when millions of people died and only a few were left. Uh, uh, um, and yet, this is one of India's most loved scriptures. And the fact that it gives no certainty, plunges you into doubt, is not a, a block, is not, is not seen as a, as a problem. And um, when, you're t when, when the Chinese talk about heaven, uh, that is their, 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 their ultimate reality, Tian it is. But Tian could also be uh, pronounced nature as well. It, it's not just heaven, it's not a place in the sky where God lives, uh, but heaven is, is, is inseparable from earth and inseparable from humanity. These things are all intertwined. The Brahman in India, it means the all. God is all that is, all that is. And the Brahman is in me and in you and in this podium, uh, in, in animals, in plants, uh, in, in a glass of water. The Brahman is present. That's why Indians hold their hands together and bow when they're in uh, in contact with. They're looking. They're looking for the divine in you, which is everywhere, omnipresent. Um, Wordsworth uh, tried, and Blake both tried to hold us back from that, from this definition of God. This God the old man in the sky. Uh, and the, and the same was happening in Germany, where our romantic poets were trying to hold us back from this rationalism, which was destroying this sense of the, the divine as all-encompassing and within you and within me. Um, and he said, Wordsworth, of course, as you know, he, he uses very simple language. But there's but you need to look at the words because he's using them in a very exact way. And I want you to notice two of these words. One of them is learned. He's learned, he says, to look at nature in a different way. In his old days, he, 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 when he was a young man, he used to be absolutely intoxicated with nature, which filled him with wild joy and terror. Uh, something utterly different that seems to, seemed to knock him sideways. Not now. Uh, now he's learned to look at it. You, he's a mystic, like just like the religious mystics 
who've learned to use certain parts of the brain that help us to see the wholeness of things, not the analytic part of the left brain, which looks, uh, analyzes and separates. Um, so he's, and, and the other word that he, I want you to look out for is something. I mean, we use that word so glibly, don't we? What should we have for supper tonight? Oh, I don't know, eggs or something. But his meaning, what he's saying here is something. I'm not going to say God, because that word has now got so devalued. Uh, I'm going to say something. Something is there when we don't know what it is. He says, so I have learned to look on nature, not as I did when I, in, in my ch mad youth, but hearing oftentimes the still sad music of humanity. So the divine and nature are utterly intertwined, not, not separate as they were before. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky and in the mind of man, a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought, and rolls through all things. Now, um, it's interesting that just at the time when we were uh, creating this idea of, this limited idea of God and this factual way of reading scripture, uh, the Jesuits uh, went to China as missionaries. They were a new order, uh, part of the Catholic Reformation, um, and they were also great scientists. Many of them were founder members of the new Royal Society that was being developed in London. Um, and they took this science with them to the Chinese where they lived among the Confucian literati. And the Chinese loved the new science. Uh, they couldn't get enough of it. They had no problem with Galileo and Copernicus, which caused great stink here, in, 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 at least in Europe. Um, uh, they, they had no problem with it at all. But, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, one of them says, when they try and talk about the ultimate reality, God, they call it seminal matters, they talk about a, a, a deity that has created the entire cosmos but lives in a tiny little part of it. Uh, they say they do not understand the limits of their language. Uh, the new uh, Western God hitting the Chinese world, where, where heaven is all-encompassing. Um, and I, I just like, so how does scripture deal with this? Well, I'd like to take a scripture which will be familiar to some of you, most of you, I should think, here. Uh, the book of Genesis um, caused a lot of problems with evolution and stuff. You know, this is not how, this doesn't gel with Darwin. But anyway, in chapter one, we're presented with a God who is everything that a God should be. He, there he is, all powerful. He simply, he doesn't have to fight monsters, as some of the, of the biblical stories said, to create the world. He just has to speak and it comes into being. Just in a sheer word, all he has to speak, and it is made. And this is a very benign God. He blesses everything that he has made. He doesn't have favorites. He's totally impartial. Um, and he blesses even his old enemy, Leviathan, uh, and uh, in total command, uh, ben kind, benign. Uh, but the rest of the book of Genesis systematically undermines that, the image of chapter one. So that uh, by chapter three, God has completely lost control of his creation. They're all doing what they want and he, he, he can't manage them at all. Um, the God who was so benign and kind and a wonderful creator, bringing all things into being, becomes a cruel destroyer in the time of the flood, wiping out almost the whole of the human race in what can only be called a fit of pique 
I repent me that I created man, he says, for no good reason, as one could see. Um, and uh, devastation, devastation, cruelty, shock. Uh, and the God who had was so impartial uh, has monstrous favoritism. He chooses Abel rather than Cain. And uh, the Hebrew tells us that when he, Cain's sacrifice is refused, his face crumples like that of a small child in shock. And it puts iron into the man's soul so that he kills his brother, that we have the first murder. Um, and Esau is rejected uh, in favor of his younger brother Jacob. Now, Esau may not be the brightest pebble on the beach, but Jacob can behave in an appalling way sometimes. Uh, we've all got faults, and Jacob certainly has them. He, he, he has his great, wonderful moments too, like many of us. But um, Esau, you're made to feel his pain. Have you no blessing for me, father? He cries. Oh, father, bless me too. Can't be done. Um, and, uh, and poor Hagar, dumped in the desert by Abraham um, uh, with her little baby Ishmael um, and uh, runs back and forth in terror until God says, look, it's going to be okay. I'm going to make your son a, a great father over a great people too. He's the father of the Arabs. But still, in the Hajj, every year, Muslims make, remember Hagar. They run back and forth. Uh, on the site uh, uh, to, to rem remember that terrifying incident uh, because Ishmael will be the father of the Arab peoples. And then finally, the God who is continually butting in and interfering and, uh, and ha advising and choosing in the early part of Genesis, he just disappears. And Joseph of his, and his brothers have to cope with their own dreams and insights and struggle uh, without any divine help, just as we do. So that God, nice, neat God is continually undercut. Uh, and um, it, if, it's interesting that the, uh, the, the, the image that mystics and uh, people, Jews kept coming back to was the vision of Ezekiel. At, in the first chapter of, the, of Ezekiel's prophecy, a most bewildering uh, image of God. You're told he looks something like this, but not completely, and something like that. And, uh, and it fills, the vision fills Ezekiel with both a rage and bitterness because he's just ha had the trauma of being exiled and taken off to Babylonia in, 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 in a captivity. Uh, but also when he tastes the scroll that God hands him with all these curses written on it, it tastes as sweet as honey. And it's that bewildering notion, that confusion, that is the truer picture of God. Uh, God, we're not being told what we should believe. As, um, there's, we're not, so don't look for certainties in Scripture. If you think you're certain about God, you've got an, almost an idol that you've created in your own image and likeness. Remember, uh, there, there's a, a, a 14th century English mystic who wrote a book called The Cloud of Unknowing that I loved as a young woman. And uh, the, uh, the, the, his student asks the, the, the writer, what is God? And the, uh, the mystic writer says, I have to tell you, I do not know. Uh, we, we're in the presence of, which, of, a, of a reality that goes beyond what words and thoughts can do, even the word, sacred words of scripture. Well, that's point one. Point two, uh, scripture does not require that we go back to the beginning and find out what scripture said originally. Um, now that's a, a, a habit that we've got. This is a tip, modern scholarship, doesn't it? It always goes back to the original text, get back to the, and, and great work is being done with, with this. And we've got, uh, we have fundamentalists, 
uh, even here in this country, uh, Christian fundamentalists who want to go back to the uh, to revive the ancient Israelite legislation in the early parts of the Bible, which would include the stoning of disobedient children. Um, this is going right back, then you're going back to the beginning. We got this from the Protestant reformers if, uh, who wanted, if you remember, to go back to the early church, the first, to, so they'd be like the first Christians. But the, with the best will in the world, they were men and women of the early modern period. They were not men and women of the first century. And in first, the first Christians were nearly all Jews. So these Christians, some of whom were anti-Semitic, uh, were not going to be able to do this. Um, and similarly, you have it in Saudi Arabia, where they revived more, the mores of the seventh century, the time at which the prophet lived to get more authentic, but they are not living in the seventh century, the hell of seventh century Arabia. It's quite a different place. So um, instead, scripture is an innovative art. And I think uh, uh, we, have, we see this very clearly in rabbinic Judaism. After the temple had been destroyed by the Romans in the year 70, uh, after the uh, after a long war with Rome, um, Jews found it the, the old scriptures almost impossible to read because the, the the temple was the center of their spirituality, the focal point uh, on which they all depended. They made pilgrimages there from all over the diaspora. It was crucial. Now it had gone and a vacuum. And some felt that it couldn't survive. Judaism could not survive this terrible shock. Uh, but the rabbis didn't just throw out scripture. Instead, they developed what they called midrash, which is a word that derives from a root meaning to go in search of something that is not self-evident. So if a rab someone would come to one of the rabbis and ask him a question, uh, instead of quoting from a, a bit of scripture, he would take a, uh, a sentence, say, from the a book of Psalms, another sentence from one of the prophets, and another sentence from Genesis, three totally unconnected texts, string them together and say, that's your answer. Uh, making, bringing together texts to make new meaning that spoke to the present. Now, the person who invented this, this inventive form of exegesis was Rabbi Akiva, who was killed by, martyred by the Romans in, early in the second century. And there's a wonderful story about him. Um, it says, that says that he, uh, the fame of his brilliance reached heaven and Moses got to hear about it and was intrigued. So he thought he'd go and try and find out for himself what was actually happening. So he came down to earth and sat in Rabbi Akiva's scripture class in the back row among the other students, but found to his intense embarrassment and dismay, he couldn't understand a word of the Torah that uh, Rabbi Akiva was expounding that had been revealed to him, to Moses on Mount Sinai. But instead of going back in a, in a huff or in a rage, he goes back to heaven, or you can almost hear him shake, see him shaking his head rather like a proud father, saying, my children have defeated me, like my children are better than I, they've gone ahead. Another rabbi put it more succinctly, he said, that which was revealed to Moses, uh, that which was not revealed to Moses, was revealed to Rabbi Akiva and his companions. Scripture was not something that had happened once in the distant past. Revelation was not confined to a distant point on Mount Sinai. It occurred every time a Jew, a, a Jewish student, confronted the sacred text. And uh, with his, uh, he would stand with his teacher as if they were both standing before Moses receiving a new revelation. And in some of the early portions of the, of the Talmud, you have a blank page for the student to put in his own insights. And if he didn't add that, uh, this revelation would be incomplete. 
because it would continue every time, so there would be something new. You must make scripture speak to the time, the voice of God. God is not, did not trumpet those words to one person a little while ago. Uh, he, and to come back to my original point, let's, we have, well, Moses for a moment, uh, that script God does, that the scriptures are not clear about God. Uh, he chooses a prophet that has the most terrible stammer. I cannot, I, ever since childhood, says Moses tells God, I've had this appalling stammer. No one can understand a word I say. No, no, no worries, says God. Uh, your brother Aaron speaks beautifully and clearly. Uh, he'll be able to speak for you. So in what, we're only getting God's words at second hand through Aaron, and goodness knows how much Aaron managed to understand of what Moses was saying. And furthermore, it's Aaron, clear, voluble, uh, sort of lucid Aaron, who is guilty of the Israelites' greatest for, uh, 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 idolatry, worshipping God in the form, simplified form of a golden calf. Uh, they don't want lucid things in, in scripture, and the rabbis weren't going to be lucid either. Um, and and so, so Midrash uh, really is the basis of the New Testament. Uh, it, actually, they, they, have a, they developed a very similar kind of exegesis, the, people, the early Christians, uh, rather the same as the Qumran community who lived beside the Dead Sea. Uh, which saw references to their own modern movement in scripture. Um, and they never, the, the, the Matthew, for example, never misses an opportunity to uh, bring in a, a text completely out of context and apply it to Jesus. Uh, when, uh, at one point, the baby Jesus who had to flee um, Herod and go to go into Egypt and become a refugee in Matthew's Matthew's story, quite different from Luke's story. Uh, they, you know, there's no co consistency here. Um, I, 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 Matthew quotes Prophet Hosea, who says, "I brought my son out of Egypt." Well, Hosea was obviously referring to Israel uh, being led out of captivity in Egypt uh, by Moses. Uh, I didn't have Jesus in mind, but Matthew uh, applies it strictly to Jesus. Uh, but and, and this could sound like some a bit of a clever dick stuff where you just pick out a text and, in a cerebral way. But it was not. It was an emotional, uh, uh, a very emotional, uh, feelingful um, form of, of, of reading scripture. And we have a, uh, an instance of it in St. Luke's Gospel, which was written probably in the early second century. Uh, in this lovely story, uh, it's just happened after Jesus has been crucified. And two of the disciples, who are not named, interestingly, uh, are walking away from Jerusalem uh, to the nearby town of Emmaus. And they're in great distress. They, they're, 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 they're beside themselves with sorrow. And a stranger passes them and says, look, I can see you're really upset. Uh, would you like to share this with me? I'm always relieved that those disciples weren't stiff upper lip Brits who would have said, oh, no, thanks, we're fine. And that would have been the end of the matter. But they don't. They take this, they take this uh, stranger into their confidence. And he could have laughed at them and make them feel a lot worse, but they take that risk and said, well, we thought Je Jesus was the Messiah and, uh, he's, and look what happened to him. And the, the stranger says, oh, slow of heart and not to read the scripture. And starting with Moses and going right the way through the prophets, he shows how it was always predicted that the Messiah would be, suffer a dreadful fate and be killed. And, uh, it, well, the scripture says no such thing. Uh, but this is this inventive e exegesis. They, they found texts, uh, very often the, the ones, the, the sorrowful texts, uh, about about the man of sorrows, by it, written by an unknown prophet whom we call Second Isaiah, uh, 
uh, which to apply to Jesus' suffering. Those he may have cited any with these. Anyway, uh, they're comforted by this, and on the when they get home, they have supper together, and Jesus breaks the bread. Uh, the stranger rather breaks the bread. And in the, that moment, they recognize Jesus, and he disappears. He goes immediately. The point is, they say, and this is my point, did not our hearts burn within us when he opened the scriptures to us? This is an emotional thing that gave you insight, not just some, as I say, some clever dick playing around with, with texts. Um, Muslims, too, have this, have always had this invented um, uh, streak. Um, about 60 years after the Prophet's death, he wouldn't have recognized Islam. Muslims were in an entirely different situation. They were in charge of a huge empire, and they developed all kinds of new spiritualities that still are still important today. Shiism, Sufism, uh, fiqh, uh, that's uh, jurisprudence, um, and, and, uh, and asceticism. All, ki uh, all kinds of new ideas. Uh, but uh, I'm quoting Ibn Arabi, a 12th century uh, mystic and philosopher, whom I may refer to again at the end. Uh, and he uh, said, every time you re recite, notice he says recite, not read. Every time you recite the Quran, it should mean something different to you. And if it doesn't mean something different, you're not read, reciting it correctly. You're not in the moment that God is telling you something for now, not what, yes, what he'd have said yesterday or tomorrow. Um, and uh, the Shu Zi, uh, a Confucian, told his students, do not read current beliefs into the sacred texts. Uh, don't look for the orthodox doctrines. Uh, don't look for something new that is speaking to you today. And we've lost that and tied ourselves up in knots, trying to be authentically going back uh, to basics, when what, what the scripture is demanding is not traditionalism, but to apply the divine, the unknowable divine, to one's situation here and now and make it speak to the present.